Yes. Can you hear me? Okay. All right. I'm gonna start up. Thanks for thanks thanks for coming in, and uh, you can uh, eat your pizza. Uh, when we'll slowly start up, uh, it'll be it'll be a pretty informal presentation. I'll try to keep it around 20 minutes, and uh, please stop me if you have any questions. Uh, be, uh, so there's not gonna be. It's not a class, right? So there's not going to be something that you don't understand. But then if you have, say, comments, for, like if you want to expand on something that's going on, or if you have something that's slightly tangential that you think will be relevant, uh, be happy to answer any questions as we're going through. But also afterwards, we'll, we'll have more questions, right? Like, so after 20 minutes, we still have uh, about half an hour to sort of jam things out, like figure out what, where we're at. OK, so welcome to the Pathways Exploration Seminar. Uh, this is for the signal processing and communications area, and uh, for somehow the, the the goal would be to uh, motivate you to, uh, to say specialize in signal processing and communication, but more importantly to uh, to help you figure out what things look like, right? Just not even from the just from the classes point of view, but also from a career point of view, what you would do after and things like that. And uh, uh, there, as you will see, there's the 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 name signal processing and communications is sort of slightly uh, misleading in the sense that it's, it's way broader than what it makes it look like. And you'll see this as you take courses at ASU and also maybe throughout the seminar, okay? So uh, I am Gautam Dasarathi. Uh, wait, so this will be nice if it worked. Oh, of course, of course it doesn't work because I haven't plugged it in, right? <laughs> so yeah, that'll be a different signal processing problem altogether. Maybe you folks will solve this. Okay, so I'm Gotham Dasarathi. People who have taken my class have seen this before. Uh, Gotham is pronounced as in Batman, like Gotham, right? Gotham City. And Dasarathi is like Maserati, the car company. So this is how you remember me. My office is in uh, GWC, it's in the third floor, right? So if you have any questions, feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I'll be around and I, uh, so, and I'll be happy to chat about any of these things or other sort of career-related questions and signal processing and communications. Okay, so let's get started. And uh, one of the first things that people ask about signal processing is, what, is, what does that mean, right? What is, a signal, what is signal processing? And uh, to understand this, uh, it's useful to understand what a signal is. So a signal is just anything that carries information. So for instance, even me, uh, saying stuff right now is signals, right? I'm giving you signals and you're understanding what's going on. Of course, if you want to build sort of computational systems or hardware systems to understand the signals that are coming in and do something with it, that's signal processing, right? So a classical example is uh, sort of say your pacemaker. Uh, so a pacemaker is a very crucial device that is uh, helpful to people. It processes the signals, that is the ECG from the, the heart heartbeat. So it tells you, the ECG signal tells you how the heart's beating. And if there's something wrong, then the pacemaker processes the signal, right? Like, so there's not someone sitting and doing this, it's the, the device that's doing this. So it processes the signal and sort of gives you the jump, uh, jump start that you need to get your heart back online, right? So this is a sort of stereotypical uh, signal processing system. And what I'll hopefully convince you today is that uh, this is, so basic, so that we have gotten so good at things like this that we have st started conquering like way harder problems, right? So we are now dealing with problems where nobody even knows how the thing that we are controlling behaves, right? Like so, so we have to uh, learn how the thing that we are controlling behaves and then uh, control it live. So, so signal, the the whole area of signal processing and communications is about dealing with these kinds of information sources and automatically processing them to do something interesting. Okay, so. I just thought I would uh, sort of give you a, a, a whirlwind tour of the things that this area encompasses. And of course, I had to start from audio, right? So this is, in some sense, very, very critical to how signal processing started. If you, if you look at the, the old school signal processing people, I get to say that, right? So <laughs> the old school signal processing people, you'd see many of them were actually musicians. Like you will have rock stars who are professors who, who, who dealt with signal processing from a very sort of hands-on point of view. They were tuning guitars, they were plugging into amplifiers, figuring out how these guitars make sounds uh, in these uh, sort of uh, amplifiers, right? And the, what you needed for that is, 
is a chip that would be able to read the signal from this guitar, the, the musical notes that this person is producing, and be able to modulate it live so that it sounds like shredding or what have you. So is there, is there a musician in the house? Okay, so you, you deal with amplifiers, you, uh, you okay. Yeah. I guess, uh, wh wh what do you folks do? Uh, do you, what kind of instrument do you play? Piano and harp, right? So, so the you don't have to do anything now because the piano has all the signal processing built into it. So, uh, what what do you do? I'm a vocalist. Oh, you're a vocalist. Okay, and that was. Oh, uh, uh, I did guitar and piano. Okay, so vocalists, you know how your entire field has been corrupted by auto tuning, right? <laughs> it's, it's insane. People used to need to work hard to be in pitch. But now you just have this app that will just get you back into pitch when you're not in pitch. I mean, that, it sounds cool, uh, uh, but then, so this is all thanks to signal processing. So maybe you hate it, but there are other things to do. Yeah. <laughs> uh, so you, and you play the? Uh, guitar and the piano. Super cool. So again, so the guitar, piano, all these things are essentially signal processing machines that have uh, gone to market, right? So we are actually seeing them post all the, the innovations. Now, you folks are at the, the forefront of the next generation of what's going to be big, what's going to get into market. So we'll figure out what you folks will be uh, sort of say contributing to the world. So, uh, so, so it started with uh, audio, and audio is sort of an easier problem than video. So we quickly transitioned to video processing, and of course, all of us are super familiar with all kinds of video devices. Everyone uh, carries one in their hand. Uh, so it used to be that. Uh, so so I, I recently started at ASU. Uh, uh, so <laughs> it used to be that you used to need to be way older to say things like, I remember the time <laughs> when there was no iPhone. Right? This is insane. I was in grad school, and uh, I remember the time when there was no iPhone. I, 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 I still, it, it still is a cognitive dissonance to me because I cannot imagine my life right now without an iPhone, without a smartphone. But uh, the, the technology that goes into sort of making your phone so alive in your hand is really the stuff that you will learn in the classes that you would see in your in your sort of this pathway, right? The how do you transmit video? How do you transmit sort of uh, so signals that that are faithful to the way that someone captured them in the source, right? So these are the kinds of things that you would read, and it will look like this, right? But uh, the things that you study will look like this, but what you get out is something kind of amazing. And thankfully to technology that you have access to right now in your, say, laptop, you could start going from here to here very fast. So it used to take a long time, a, lo a lot of effort to go from uh, sort of conceptualizing what, what should happen to how you should build uh, an app or a device or something that can go to a consumer's hand, but now you can sort of jam out over summer and release an app on the App Store, right? Like so, really, the you should take this as an opportunity because you're so close to the market that there is no reason to not leverage this. So it, it, you don't need these traditional channels of getting to the market. So. So video compression, uh, video processing, all these things are sort of uh, other classical examples of signal processing. And uh, the other more, uh, there are more sort of uh, critical applications, I would say, which are sort of medical devices. Uh, the, the technology behind medical devices has increased a lot. So, and it's, it constantly pays to keep thinking about what the signal is and what the processing is, right? So in medical devices, the, say for instance, this is a, a plug-in. It was several years ago now where you could sort of just buy something that, could, that you could plug into your iPhone and you should, you'll be able to measure your blood pressure, right? So here, the signal is the, the sort of the differences of your blood flow that is being detected by this device and the processing is what converts that signal into the numbers that tells you what the blood pressure is. So, so things like this, right? So basically, uh, uh, so these kinds of devices are getting better uh, every day. So who who here has had to have an MRI scan? Okay. So uh, so how long was your MRI scan? Forever. Forever, right? And how long was yours? Also forever. For yeah. forty five minutes. Wow. So so it, actually, MRI scans used to take two hours, and not just that, but they also are extremely annoying, right? Because you sit inside this metal tube. And then there is this extremely loud thing on your ears, and it is like constantly screaming at you. I, I'm, I'm sure that's not fun for anyone. So the, the thing is, the way that uh, signal processing, th this area is advancing, is of course that 
we come up with problems. So it's clear why we need an MRI. So I, I tore my ACL. Uh, so I need an MRI because the doctors had to figure out what's going on, right? So, it, so one, it's clear what we need to do. And it's, so people are constantly thinking about what are the signals we can measure about what we say can't touch to figure out how to deal with it, right? And so the, the new kind of innovations is turning that into faster computational infrastructure. So now, actually, I think in the next five years, MRIs will become super fast because they have, uh, they have come up with new uh, algorithmic advances, which will make MRI extremely fast. So hopefully, we'll have a time where you could just go pop into an MRI machine for three minutes and then like, get, get your entire MRI done and then pop out. So these are the kinds of extremely uh, real impact you can have on people's lives. right? Now, these are people who. Uh, are at the weakest of their time. So somehow these are very motivating for several people to work on uh, these kinds of applications. So medical devices are uh, very rife for uh, innovations and also uh, sort of impact. So the next thing, this is a little bit more out there. Uh, if, of course, everybody's heard of Elon Musk, right? And uh, who's, who here has heard of uh, Neuralink? Everybody knows Tesla, SpaceX. So you've heard of Neuralink. Like, uh, I did, we did a little presentation on it back when they were um, okay. trying to heal a monkey's broken leg okay. through its spinal cord by uh, attaching neural links through its brain and uh, through a helmet. Yeah, yeah. So, in fact, actually, the, you're, you're using Neuralink as a noun. There's actually a proper noun. It's called Neuralink, N-E-U-R-A-L-I-N-K, I think. It is uh, Elon Musk's new company. Okay, so he has all this weird stuff. So he has this boring company. Uh, so the, the, his new venture is called Neuralink, where he hopes to completely solve this problem where you would be able to communicate straight from the brain to a device, right? Like so, so what you're doing, you, you put something onto your, your medulla oblongata, and you're able to read the signals. So here, you would just sell a device to a person, they would put on a helmet, and the computer will be able to just read their mind, right? So, so this is a really cutting edge technology where you're directly plugging into the human brain to understand what's going on. So for this, you need to understand how the neurons are connected, how they're talking together, and how devices uh, would kind of use the signals that the neurons are, uh, are communicating between each other and then circumvent it to do something useful, right? So imagine the time when, uh, okay, I don't want to imagine this time, where say you could wear a helmet and just uh, say, know the answer to a question from your friend, right? You don't have to do anything. You don't have to talk. You don't have to type. You'll just know, okay, I don't know. I want to know what the answer to this question is. You could be sitting in a test, for instance, or not, and uh, you will know the answer to this question. So uh, it's, it's, it's kind of, it, the, the, the fun thing, of course, is that we are, we are, we are advancing so fast that there is no difference between science fiction and what's actually possible. You would you'd be, you'd just blink and then someone would have something that's really crazy, that's really close to science fiction. So, and uh, of course, as engineers, we want to ask very fundamentally whether these things are possible. And it turns out that we're making a lot of progress in things like cochlear implants. It sounds, uh, it doesn't sound like the same problem, but it really is because what we're doing there is we're uh, circumventing audio signals, right? Like, so these are things that are going into the brain. It's not that we are producing any sound. We're actually convincing the brain that the sound exists, even though the, the brain is not, the ear is not able to pick up on the sound. So, so there are a lot of interesting applications for Neuralink and uh, deep brain simulations is the kind of thing that you're talking about, where you're able to simulate the brain directly to sort of uh, t tackle some of the most hard diseases that we ever know, like Alzheimer's and things like that. So. So, the, so this, this is another wide area of applications where we're going to use kind of processing signals and data and all these things, right? So this is uh, another example. And uh, of course, there are several, several examples. So I, I just like, I'm highlighting a few. And uh, the, the ones that are, I'll just, so there's radar, LIDAR, sonar, and all these things are ways of measuring things that are not extremely visible in the, they're not extremely visible to the human eye, right? And uh, so we all use radar maps. So this I just pulled out. Uh, so I went, I went to grad school in Wisconsin. So, <laughs> um, uh, so it's like, I'm so glad I'm here now. Uh, it's insane. So the wind chill there is minus 60. I don't even know what that means. So I was in Madison, Wisconsin, and the wind chill there was minus 64. Anyway, 
So this is stuff that you would like to know from far away, of course, right? Like <laughs> from Phoenix, we can look at those folks. So I texted this image to all my friends and my advisor and stuff. It's pretty hilarious. So of course, uh, we, we are cur currently using this technology, but we're also innovating rapidly on top of this. For instance, uh, autonomous vehicles. Uh, so people have seen Waymo, I'm sure, all over in uh, Tempe and Chandler. Uh, they use all these uh, LiDAR and radar to figure out how, whether there's any obstacles. So if you believe that the self-driving cars are the next big thing, this is where you need to be, right? Because you have to figure out, how does the car figure out what's there and how, how to make the decisions based on uh, what it senses in the environment? Uses technologies like LiDAR, LiDAR and radar, okay? So, okay, this has stopped working. Okay, I'll just use this. Okay, so of course, there are also, uh, this is a whole different ball game altogether. Uh, drones, we all have, I, I'm more excited about the, the consumer applications, but of course, it's, uh, it's super interesting for uh, military applications, but drone, drones are already here, and uh, we, are, we just have a lot more complicated processing tasks when you have things that are, have three degrees of freedom. And uh, I'll, I'll tell you more about that when in the question answer session, right, about the, the difference between having just two degrees of freedom and three degrees of freedom. And of course, uh, once you have signals, you would like to communicate between these devices, so this is where communications comes up. So you have a lot of courses at ECE where you'll deal with uh, communicating systems. So your cell phone is talking to a tower all the time, so that's how you get your signals right into your phone. And then your cell phone is talking to other cell phones, that's how you get like a communication network. So if I airdrop you something, or if I send you something via Bluetooth, these are communication networks. And uh, finally, uh, we, are, we are kind of getting to this world where everything is gonna be connected, right? Your, your refrigerator has Wi-Fi now. Who has a fridge with a Wi-Fi? Okay, so you folks are a lot more conscientious than other people have seen. So who has a smart speaker? Like an echo, okay, you've already sold your soul. <laughs> okay, so, it was a gift. <laughs> was a gift. Yeah. Yeah. It's worth it. <laughs> oh yes, if you're, if you're, yeah, for Jeopardy, I'm totally sure it's worth it. But yeah, so, so we have, uh, we have constantly these uh, connected devices that are, going, that are gonna change the entire landscape. So in fact, uh, by 2020, people are expecting that uh, there are four billion connected people there are 25 plus billion connected devices, right? So these are devices that, are ac that have access to the internet, that are constantly talking to each other, and we need folks like you to figure out how they talk to each other in the right way. And it's not just about the most efficient way, right? We also wanna make sure that, so there's a story in, uh, with Amazon Alexa that it apparently randomly picked up a segment of conversation between two people and emailed it to their friend or something. So you don't want stuff like that to happen, right? So we want to have safe and uh, efficient technology. So, so uh, we, are, we are kind of uh, barreling through that. So 2020 is just next year, and th this sort of, these predictions are coming uh, true. So finally, uh, also the, the really nice thing about ASU is that we, uh, we think a, a lot broader than the, the classical sort of spheres. Uh, there's uh, very interesting applications that people in the arts and media de uh, engineering department are using sort of signal processing for. So there's uh, performance aspects to it, there's, uh, uh, there's embodied performance, there's interactive shows that we think will be a reality very soon because of the, the work that the AME people are putting in. So, so just, uh, we, I'll sort of pivot onto something else unless there's a question. Like, so we're doing questions live so we can take a little bit more time. So if there are more questions, uh, let me know before I sort of like move on to the next thing. Yeah, do you have a question? Uh, <coughs> nothing else just right now. Okay, cool. Uh, Amazon. Yes. So you had a slide about um, the like cameras and stuff like yes. that. Yes. So is there's like career opportunities in that field for um, if we go through um, signals? Yeah, it's a camera, so what do you mean by that? Um, just like image. Yeah, so in fact, uh, so sort of, if you wanna, the reason why I asked you that was you could build cameras mm -hmm. or you could care about what happens after an image is captured, like you could say process images, you could have like automated pipelines to figure out what's the best way to enhance an image, you know, like so things like that. So there's a whole bunch of, all along the path of that pipeline, there's a whole bunch of careers. And we'll, we'll get to the, the careers part in a second, right? Oh. So I'm, I'm getting there. So the, the other big elephant in the room, of course, is 
uh, data science and machine learning, right? Like, so this is sort of uh, very close to my heart. This is what I do for a living. And, uh, uh, and this has become uh, really, really big, right? So in the sense that, so signal processing is about capturing signals and fi understanding the system well enough that you can program a computer to do the thing that you want it to do, right? Like for instance, you don't want to be pressing the button that is, uh, that is firing off the, the pacemaker, right? You want the computer to figure out how to do it on its own. What if you don't really understand the system at all? It turns out that you can just learn what's happening from data, right? So you, you can build computers that like, that like children would observe the universe and sort of learn this from the data automatically and then use that to do the control things that we are interested in. So of course, as people who are familiar with signal processing, you, you will have a great advantage going into this whole landscape of uh, machine learning and data science. Uh, uh, so there is essentially, there's significant shortage in people who know this stuff. So this means that when you go out into the market, you will, you'll be picked off, right? So if you know any of this stuff, yeah, there, there's going to be no, no trouble getting a job because uh, there's significant shortage in people who sort of understand how to use data to derive intelligence. So uh, McKinsey and Company is a famous uh, analytics firm, and they have predicted that uh, you, the, the, the shortage is going to just get bigger and bigger. You can Google this. There are all these uh, reports that come out every year. And the, the, the demand for these data science jobs versus the number of people who are qualified is just like growing, right? So you are at the right sort of place to contribute to a uh, big deficit. Okay. So finally, uh, of course, uh, there are several applications to machine learning. I'm not going to go through this. Uh, you're, if you're Netflix watcher, Amazon watcher, how does Netflix know what movie you think, uh, it thinks that you will like, right? It uses machine learning to figure this out. And uh, uh, online advertising, like I have, uh, I'm, I'm embarrassed to say how many things that I've bought from my Facebook ads. It's kind of insane. Like they're, they're so spot on. I, I mean, okay, I, that's exactly what I want, right? So online advertising, it uses machine learning because it's not, there, it's not like someone sitting there and saying, here, uh, Gotham likes this particular thing, right? This is the data. It's using the data to figure out what, what I like. And uh, we, use, uh, we use sort of, in more other applications apart from the internet, there is kind of sport analytics. Now there are people used to sit with Excel sheets to figure out these sport uh, questions, like who's, the, who's gonna be the next best, say, scorer in this league, right? So now there are algorithms that are figuring this out. And stock market trading, uh, most of the times, most of the decisions are made by computers. No, not, people are not sitting and making these trades. Everything is automated. And uh, so the, the next big frontier, of course, is personalized medicine and personalized engineering, right? Like, so it's not that a one size fits all helps all, I mean, one size fits all works for medicine, actually. That's the only thing that we can do right now. But once we figure out how to do this using data, the hope, the hope will be that I could go in, I could get my DNA sequenced, and I'll get a pill that will work exactly only for me, right? So this is where we're really getting there. So the, where our data processing abilities are coming to where we can do stuff like this. So, so, the, so this is sort of using data, uh, data to do uh, sort of mush, data to do signal processing, right? So I really like to think about the signal processing communication areas as sort of sensor data science, where the, you also deal with the sensors that are accumulating data, because that's what you folks will be studying, and then you learn how to process this data to do interesting stuff. And this is the thing that you wouldn't learn, say, in a purely computer science program. So which is why I, I want to argue that you're at a very unique place to make contributions to this area, right? Like, so as a signal processing and machine learning person. And uh, career opportunities, we'll talk more about this when people have questions, but there are several companies that are hiring in traditional uh, signal processing areas, right? So these are things like working with cameras, working with video, working with audio, and using biomedical signal processing to do interesting things. Uh, the automotive industry is big into signal processing, all the, right from the traditional settings where you're just reading the cars, the ECU of the car, which there's a chip in the car that's doing all the stuff. It's reading all these signals from your car and figuring out whether the ABS needs to be applied or the anti-skid. So like I said, I was in Wisconsin, the anti-skid totally helped me. And uh, so I don't have to worry about that now. So, uh, 
so that, that's traditional automotives, but also now with the self-driving cars, which the, it's, we don't even know what the landscape looks like because now we have all these other signals, which are the, how the car is reading the environment and how do you use that to make decisions, right? So the automotive industry is big into uh, SP comm engineers. Uh, the government, of course, uh, we, we, are, we are sort of heavily reliant on signals, signals intelligence. And we're also heavily reliant on, so the, the weather service and all these things are reliant on sort of these signal processing pipelines. And uh, also academia, like people like me, who the, the, my job is to teach people like you. So if you, if you have interest in sort of being in the education sector, uh, that's also a great, great uh, career. And of course, the, the secret is that the most, I mean, half of my job, let's say, I do research, right? So you, you end up at the cutting edge of the field in which you're teaching. So that if you want to be, sort of inventing new algorithms, inventing new pipelines that, that people will use, say, 10 years down the line or five years down the line, that's a, that's a good career opportunity as well. Okay, so I will also flash another slide. So Harvard Business Review said that data scientist is the sexiest job of the 21st century, right? So we're all adults here, I could use that word. But uh, so uh, it, it's sort of like, like I said, the, the idea is, as signal processing people, you, you not only learn how to process data, but if you also understand that you can build systems by just learning from data, that's just one step away from you getting all these, comp all these companies hiring you, right? So there are, co there are courses at ECE which will teach you how to get more sort of uh, attractive for companies like this. So once you have data science on your CV, the whole world kind of opens up. Uh, Facebook and Skype and all these things. There are also several startups that are hiring like crazy. Uh, I can, uh, I have a, f a friend who consults for this startup who, I'm not kidding, made an offer for a fresh PhD student which was on the, at the north of $250,000, right? Like, so this is just out of school. So this kid knows nothing, right? So, <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so, I'm, yeah, but, so it's a it's a realistic uh, realistic chance, and I think that the it's it's not just about so the money is just one thing, right? Of course, money is important, and all these things, but the money signals the the demand, right? So this is how I like to think about it: the economics signal how how uh, attractive these things are to the broader market. So even if you don't want to think about it in terms of how much money I'll make, it is really you're working on the cutting edge problems that everybody cares about. So so I would I would encourage you to sort of think about these things. Okay. So now getting to the, the, the important part, right? So there's, there's several faculty, uh, uh, this is there in your handout, I, w I won't be able to go through everyone. Uh, so there's several faculty who specialize in all these, all these things that we spoke about. There's signal processing, uh, communications, which involves information theory, networks, uh, machine learning, and all these things. So you could, you could look at this, and e the one thing I can vouch for is everybody here, as far, I mean, I've met, I've met several of these people, I've met all of them, uh, everybody's super friendly, right? So you should be very, very, very uh, comfortable with reaching out. Like you should be able to shoot emails to them, uh, tell them you want to chat about uh, their research or about just prospects, about ideas. I mean, they'll be more than happy to chat with you. So uh, please make use of the fact that ASU is such a big, diverse school, and it's really at the cutting edge of this very interesting, very exciting field. Okay? Um, if there are no more questions, I'll quickly run through sort of courses that you would see and how they would uh, contact with this kind of career trajectory, right? Are there any questions? Okay. Cool. So, so the, the junior level courses, uh, I guess some of you have already uh, done some of these courses, right? So I, I had some people in my, in my class last time, I taught random signal theory. And uh, so, sig so signals and systems, uh, is generally just introducing this whole area, right? Like, so here you would think about what are signals. So I, I kind of was fast and loose about it, but you'd be, you'll see this very, very clearly, what signals are and how do you build systems to process these signals, right? So that's signals and systems. And uh, random signal theory is, of course, uh, when your signals are no longer deterministic. So if you have, if things are random, how do you still deal with them? So in fact, uh, I showed, I have this toy in my office, so you're welcome to come and see this. So. These guys know because they were in my class. So it was essentially, it, it, it shows you how randomness, even though things are random, they become extremely predictable, right? Like, so this is something called the central limit theorem, and you'll, you'll see things like that in random signal theory, where the idea is that 
uh, you'll be, uh, you'll, you use sort of the tools of probability to deal with signals. And everything in life is kind of random, so you have to like, deal with randomness. So these three are super important courses, and I think uh, 203 and 350 are uh, really, really important. So you'll sort of the basic understanding for doing anything in signal processing and communications. Right? So then you have uh, senior level courses, which are sort of DSP, which is uh, dealing with sort of a slightly higher level version of signal processing, where you build pipelines that deal with sort of digital signals, right? And uh, like I said, once you know how to process signals, you want to be able to communicate them. So communication systems and communication networks will help you do that. And there's more uh, sort of focused courses like uh, real-time DSP, where the idea is that, let's say you're dealing with a pacemaker again, you want to be able to do that decision fast, right? It's not, you don't have the time to sort of take your, you don't, you don't have the luxury to take as much time as you want to make the decision whether to fire that pacemaker or not. So you will learn techniques like that in real-time DSP. And, uh, and then like there are very interesting graduate level classes. So again, this is in your handout. I won't be able to go through each and every one of them, but there's, so this is interesting that there are several courses that say uh, theory, but you'll see that this is an engineering department. So even though it says theory, you'll be uh, sort of studying problems that are motivated by real world engineering applications. So you will learn uh, the kind of both the math underlying the whole thing and how to build systems based on the math. Yes. A quick question. Does the four plus one program apply to this field of engineering as well? Yes, it does. Yeah. Uh, but for more on this, I, I will di direct you to Lynn, right? Yes. Yes, but it does, and that, that's, a, that's a really good option, and we, we should chat more, yeah. Thank you. So, uh, I didn't see 430, I'm sorry, uh, 4, 480 and 481, do those fall under the signals, so, like feedback, feedback systems and, and computers? So, so broadly it does, but, right? Controls, uh, controls group. Yeah, it broadly. So the, the idea is that so systems is a very broad area, right? And there's some way to sort of divvy them up so that uh, we have different faculty dealing with these things. But uh, if you if you were interested in any kind of uh, controls, right? Like so, then you would do 480 and those kinds of courses. But you would need yes. If I may interrupt, we're going to have a controls pathways coming right. too. So. For my emails. Awesome. Right. Yeah, there's going to be yeah. So so the, the, all these courses will be dealt with in one of these pathways, but it, it broadly falls area. So you would you'd be you'd be interested if you're interested in controls, you'll be interested in several of these courses. If you're interested in these courses, you'll be interested in several of the controls courses. Okay. So and of course there are also uh, communications courses where the idea is that you when you're dealing with communication systems actually some of the biggest advances came from this area called information theory this was in AT&T Bell Labs in the uh, sort of late 40s and uh, we, we you once you study that I, I would say that uh, information theory was the one course that made me see the light right so it was it was mind blowing and i think that you you'll see it's kind of the the beautiful math behind how control system, so communication systems work and how they sort of uh, feed into your everyday devices that you're using every day, right? So, so I, would, I would recommend these courses when you're considering sort of graduate level classes in communications. And of course, the cherry on the cake is that, there, like I said, there's an extremely diverse body of faculty here. And uh, everybody is sort of, I mean, people get hired because they're leaders in their field. And uh, so they, they get to offer uh, courses that are extremely specialized, right? So these are sort of courses that will take you to the cutting edge of that particular area. Uh, I don't claim to be a leader, but <laughs> I te I'm teaching a course on machine learning, right? Like, so this semester, uh, there's a course I'm teaching on statistical machine learning, where the idea is that you, how do you use the things that you learned, say, in a signal processing ECE background, and how do you convert that into sort of building machine learning systems, right? So uh, we geek out a lot on uh, sort of math, but it's it's a lot of fun. So so we have so there are a lot of courses here which are graduate level sort of ma upper masters PhD level courses that will help you specialize in several areas. So uh, the Smart Grid, which is very hot here, especially in the Phoenix area, in the Arizona area, complex networks, uh, radar, and all these things. Right. So again, this is in your handout. Uh, happy to answer questions about any particular course as much as I can. Uh, but we'll pivot to some of the 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 details of implementation, right? So, like I said, the SPCOM fields are advancing rapidly. And uh, so, 
uh, you asked about the four plus one program. The, one of the main things is that companies are increasingly uh, looking for more than a bachelor's, right? So this has kind of become uh, like there's with, with just a bachelor's, it's much harder to get a job at, at these sort of uh, interesting uh, niche areas than, than it is when you have a master's or a PhD. So, uh, so ASU provides several options for a master's. So there's a four plus one program. There's also a MSc. Uh, which is without a thesis and a mass MS with a thesis. Uh, both, are, both have their own advantages and disadvantages. The, it, it, it really, so I guess I wouldn't call it advantages and disadvantages. It's sort of uh, figuring out what you would like to do, right? Like if you want to do a bunch of courses and get out, you would do an MSc. If you want to sort of do a, a small research project that would like put you in contact with a professor who's working on a particular area, I would pick the MS option. And also, like I said, uh, PhDs have first become more popular, so a lot more people are doing PhDs, which means that the demand has also increased, right? So more people who, are, who have a PhD. And which means that, uh, so this is a nice time for you to really think about that, right? Like, so you can really consider uh, what kind of careers you would get if you have a PhD. And ASU has several options to do this. So there's a, a direct PhD option, which means that right after your bachelor's, you sort of enroll into a PhD program and you can finish both an MS and a PhD in four years, right? Which is kind of phenomenal. I mean, the, like I said, if you, if just in terms of the monetary uh, benefits, it's like a huge bump in terms of the kinds of jobs that you can get right out of a PhD. And also uh, it, it gives you, uh, so I really enjoyed my time in grad school because it gave me the freedom to be uh, like just thoughtful, right? Like you, don't, you never get this uh, if you're working like every day. So you just can chill. Right? And then think about like hard problems, which is, which is something that I would really value. So more questions about this uh, I could answer, or maybe even now, right? Like, are there any questions about just the, the nitty gritties of the implementation of the pathway? So is anyone here vaguely thinking about uh, a PhD or an MS? Okay, cool. So. Uh, you should you should keep chatting with people, like both professors and also Lynn and all the all your advisors, because they know a lot about. Uh, I mean, they've seen several people like you, right? So they know how what what would be the right kind of things to do in order to get get yourself set for this. And uh, and of course, uh, several people that I know who are the most successful uh, with or without a PhD knew this only afterwards, right? Like so, they would they would sort of do an MS, they would kind of get towards the end of the MS, and they'd be like, okay, maybe I should I should spend a few more years and get a PhD. So that's a that's a possibility as well. So so these are the sort of options for getting beyond the bachelors, and uh, especially given that uh, the kind of prospects are just exploding, I would uh, seriously ask you to consider this. Okay, I'll flash the slide up, and then we'll just take questions. So the main takeaway is that there. Are uh, myriad applications for signal processing, communications, machine learning. And then there's also really, the, the one thing that is amazing is that uh, usually when you have a field which is sort of ra advancing very rapidly, right? Like for instance, the internet, right? The, it was uh, in the 90s and stuff, the internet was the big hot thing. The, the, the foundations of the internet was not super deep. I mean, it was just, it was an engineering problem and people are figuring out how to do this engineering problem. It's very rare that something that's hot in the, in the industry also has like very deep, beautiful mathematical foundations. So, uh, I would, so if, you, if you are vaguely interested in math, this is the place to be. Because not only are you doing some very cool math, but also you're doing like, things that are impacting people every day. Right? So, so I, 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 would, I, I wanted to put it up there just to sort of drive this point home. It's, it's super rare for something like this to happen. Anyway. Never a better time to take up this pathway. Um, I'm happy to answer any questions and also any comments about this whole thing. If you have any questions, I'll be around also. Okay. Cool. Thank you. <laughs>